And I started uh, the senior bit, which is, is my great love. Uh, I think it's been 27 years now I've been doing it. I was young when I started doing these senior shows. Now I'm catching up. They must have thought you were so cute oh, just playing boy. our music. I remember one time I had this gal walk up and she says, I, she grabs this and she goes, I really like this. <laughs> Thank you. I feel weird. I feel funny, Mommy. <laughs> Welcome to Room 6, the channel dedicated to the local music scene and the people that make it, including me and this guy. My guest today is a singer, songwriter, and pianist with a penchant for tickling the ivories to thousands of seniors throughout the valley. He's mixing musical talent with humor because laughter is the best medicine. I like all this. <laughs> Discovered in the hallways of the blues, drawn from the wells of the gospel and inspired by the colors of jazz, and his latest CD is Dreamworld. Please welcome to the channel, Johnny Fabulous. Hello, everybody. Hey. Thanks for having me. No worries. Welcome officially to the Cheers. channel. Cheers. That is not water. <laughs> <laughs> I got told on again. Huh. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you trying to... <laughs> <laughs> I've seen your act, bud. <laughs> um, so, real quick, number one, thank you for coming on the channel. Yeah. Number two, uh, I wanted to start with a couple of usual questions like, how long have you lived in Vegas? year and a half. Not long. That's right. Because you came from the Bay Area. That's right. Santa Cruz. Go Niners. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, we moved here from Walnut Creek. Oh, okay. They moved here, uh, pointing to my father-in-law off camera. They moved here from, well, where was the last place you lived? Venetia? Yeah, Venetia. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, we used to, we moved here actually, uh, like, just down the street from where my wife was born at the Kaiser Permanente Walnut Creek. Oh. Yep. Met her in Davis. But I'm so I'm so cowboy originally. So, all right. Uh, what prompted the move from the Bay Area to the to Vegas? Because I know that what you do, your your act, your act, which we'll get into, the Bay Area has it got a little work for you up there. Oh, I was busy. Yeah. I was really busy. Um, we, uh, I was doing about 300 gigs a year. Mm. Uh, you know that is of, busy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know. Like for a week, I would do nothing, and then I'd have ten gigs the next week. So it wasn't like this, you know, consistent thing. But okay. a lot of senior shows. Maybe I'd do one in the morning and do another one in the afternoon. Sometimes three a day, but usually two. And I had a really great circuit. You know, I went as far south as uh, Carmel Valley and north to Palo Alto and everything in between, Gilroy and all that. Right. And I started uh, the senior bit, which is is my great love. Uh, I think it's been 27 years now I've been doing it. I was young when I started doing these senior shows. Now I'm catching up. They must have thought you were so cute oh, just playing boy. our music. I remember one time I had this gal walk up and she says, I, she grabs this and she goes, I really like this. <laughs> Thank you. I feel weird. I feel funny, Mommy. <laughs> help? Uh, but I enjoy it. There's, uh, there's some real... I guess the thing about the senior homes is I, I drive there going, this is going to be great. And I leave there going, that was nice. People tapped their toes. They sang along. We had some laughs. Right. It's all good. But sometimes there are things that happen are just, I don't know if you can say miraculous, but they're amazing. And you get to see the power of music in the moment in action. And I'll give you the, the most wonderful of all the stories is I was playing at a, a place in Morgan Hill. Okay. And, uh, Kind of a big room, they had a piano right in the middle, and I walk in and say, hello, everybody. Are um, you playing in the round? And, <laughs> in the round. And, uh, and there was a guy in a wheelchair, maybe six, eight feet away from the piano, older fellow, probably in his mid-80s, uh, very heavy set. Mm -hmm. And I sat down on the piano, and I just did this kind of Liberace roll-up. Right? And the guy just burst out the song, whoa, you know. <laughs> and I just, it kind of was startling, and I went, Okay, so I thought, well, I'll do a song that we all know, and I'll have everybody sing. And uh -huh. he just kept singing, and kept singing. And then I saw, like, the caregivers, like, whispering to each other, They're pointing, pointing at him. And then I saw people start coming in from other parts of the building, like the janitor and the gal up the front desk. Oh, I think I know what's going on. Go ahead. And so finally, one of the caregivers whispers in my ear, he hasn't spoken since he moved in. 
Wow. First sounds he uttered since he moved into the place where musical. And I to, nobody could have ruined my day. No. That day. I was on cloud nine. And, you know, there's been other wow. stories. That's probably the most dramatic. And I, I did follow up, and he spoke for like a couple weeks, and then he went silent again. Oh. And I think he passed not too long after that. But this is the thing about music. I've been thinking about this all day because I knew we were going to gather. Right. <laughs> is there's, this, there's this thing in music, in today's music, I find lacking in that there's I don't I don't hear healing qualities in a lot of it, yeah. and there is such healing power in music, and uh, you know it can lower your blood pressure, blood pressure, uh, certainly calm the mind, right? Uh, maybe have a release, an emotional release. It does so many things. The endorphins and the serotonin, yeah, yeah, help you sleep. Just all good. And uh, in in my world, it my view of music changed doing senior shows year after year after year because I could see the power of music affecting the residents in a, in a beautiful manner. Mm -hmm. So I, I took the focus off of my original music uh, to, to a great degree uh, because I was just doing it, enjoying what I was doing. Right. I just love them. And, and, you know, it's mostly little old ladies because the men don't live as long. Well, yeah. it's true. Especially, and, especially when you're married. <laughs> and, and they're just sweet Mm -hmm. And there's no weird agendas, like, you know, you go play some little dive bar or whatever, you don't know what's going to be there and what's going to happen. But nobody's, you know, trying to get laid or score a bag or, you know. Right, right. They're there for music. They clap when you're done with a song. They're not gaming. No. Yeah. <laughs> they're not gaming. Yeah. And uh, and I just, I just enjoy them. I like the era of humor that they grew up with. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, when I was a kid, I was really like into the Marx Brothers and... And the golden age of radio of Fibber McGee and Molly, the great Gildersleeve. And I love the, you know, George Burns and, you know, Jack Benny, all that stuff. It's right. just deep in my bones. So the humor that I try and present to them is coming from that space. Right on. So now for all the kids that are confused, that are under 30, who, that, <laughs> all the people he just listed. Yeah. <laughs> well, look it up. Google it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wouldn't Google have been great when we were even... Even 20. We had encyclopedias. You remember those uh, I sold that, them. Yeah. Did you really? Wow. <laughs> yes, out of a kiosk in the mall. <laughs> oh, my God. I, I don't think I've ever met an encyclopedia. World book before. encyclopedias. We had the world books. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. They had pictures. I couldn't afford the Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> we had those, too, but <laughs> yeah. but they didn't have put cool pictures. <laughs> yes. Well, now that we're done dating ourselves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, you, you hosted a TV show at one point. Yeah, that was 10 years ago. Where was that? That was not here, right? In Santa Cruz, was there was a uh, local cable access uh, channel. Yep. It was downtown on Pacific Avenue. It's called Wayne's World. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and there was a bar that I worked at a lot. I played there a lot. And the, the owner, Jerry, uh, was a, we were bros, you know. And I don't know how the idea, no, somebody else approached me about this show. So I went to Jerry and I said, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to have a show the bar was called The Pocket. Nice name. And, yeah, what, right? Was it a billiard place, mostly? It had or? one pool table. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, was it a jazz place? You're in The Pocket? On, on Mondays. <laughs> he had a wild, wild variety of music. It I love a, those places. It was a glorious little place. And so what we would do is we would film the interviews uh, at The Pocket, sitting at the bar. and uh, But we would film the band's performances uh, at the studio downtown. Uh -huh. And and the guy that had approached me this uh, on the on the project did all the editing and and I sit there and give him my two guests but he did the most of the work and then eventually he threatened one of the other guys at the station oh, and no. the show got the boot because he got barred from there Don't, so we only did yeah. nine episodes but they're great in fact my wife Pam's on one of them now, what is it called is it still in out the there? in the pocket with Johnny Fabulous and there's nine episodes on YouTube right on. I caught a little bit of, of one of them. I don't remember which one. Probably mm -hmm. the first one. Whatever was up, the first on the list. But um, it, it's it's a shame that you couldn't do something like that here. Yeah. You know? I mean, there is... Um, is there... I don't even know if there is a cable channel, access channel here. With the internet, I mean, why bother? You know. I guess so. You know? I guess that's right. That's right. I'm, so, I'm so, like, ant antiquated. Yeah. <laughs> it's all good, man. No school yeah. like the old school. Yeah, you know, I hear those inter interwebs or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
Uh, I got pulled over for going too fast on the information highway. <laughs> so, are you familiar with the musical With Your Name? No. 1975, music director for Cardiff High School, Alan McFadden, created a musical called Johnny Fabulous. Oh, cut it out. And it went for years in that area of the high schools. They, he, like, parsed it out. And, and where was this? A Cardiff High School. I don't, I don't remember the state, I'm sorry to say. Hmm. But I just was, it came across, and I was like, wow, he must not know about this. I don't. Awesome. All right, well, that's all I got. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see no, you. No, seriously. Um, so, so I just thought that was a... You might, you know, be interested. I will check that, that out. That's awesome. So I wanted to talk also um, about uh, how long you've been doing music. Well, we had a, a piano, a baby grand piano at the house when I was growing up. My mom says that when I was about two, mm -hmm. uh, I started hitting the keys. It's the gateway drug. All right. <laughs> and she said, once I figured out that I could get sounds by touching the keys, she said, she said, you never left the piano. She said, I was by far the easiest of her three children <laughs> to, to raise because I was just busy with it. And, uh, and I just, I just ate it and drank it and slept it and, and had this relationship with the piano. I remember as a little boy, just a little guy, and I'd crawl under the piano and just look at the, look at the underside of it, you know, and then you'd go and touch the strings with your fingers Ooh. and, you know, just, just this real thing. So, so it didn't start with lessons. It started with a love affair. It did. It really did. Nice. And uh, I did take some lessons from a gal. She was a elderly woman. And the, the, probably the best word I could use to describe her was cranky. <laughs> very, very cranky. <laughs> Perfect <woman>. teacher. <laughs> and uh, in, in fact, her name was kind of cranky. Her name was Mrs. Babcock. Oh, it just sounds nice. cranky, doesn't it? Anyhow, oh, and she God. was of that school uh, or thought that if you hit the wrong note, they'd whack your hand. Oh, man. And I just, I was so stunned by it. And then she would yell and things like that. And, I, and so I totally ratted her out to my mother. My mother came down on her. And I quit. But I kept playing. Yeah, this is old school, old school. <laughs> they would. Uh, they take uh, a ruler teacher. to whack your hand. Yep. Um, I, not, many, not a lot of people know this nowadays, but I, I studied dance for 10 years, actually. Well, yeah. Tap ballet, jazz, did the whole thing. Um, and it, even for one semester in college, I thought, I'm going to be a dance major and 7 a.m. barefoot wooden floor modern dance. It, it didn't last long. Um, and, uh, plus, I was a call. I was away from college. Suddenly, you you realize I need sleep to do this, and I'm not sleeping because I'm at college. Oh. So yeah, but I um, I was fortunate because my teachers grew up with those teachers, and so they didn't want to be those teachers. Yeah. But I heard horror stories about oh. what they do, especially to the ballerinas. Uh, yes. On dancing on on point, because man, po dancing on point is bad enough for your feet, but the things that they would do. But anyway, but we're not here for that. So, so there was a piano there, and uh, and I had lessons for a little while, uh, but my ear was already developing. Mm -hmm. My ear was pretty, you know, pretty decent at that point already, and I was already starting to like make up songs. I didn't call it writing songs back there. Hey, Ron, I'll play this song I made up, and. Uh, after that, uh, I just played for a few years and then we found another teacher and she yelled at me and my mom climbed on her too. And then I found one more teacher after that and his name was Alan Ray and he was a, he was a music professor at the college in Fresno. I grew up in Fresno, California. And, uh, and he was wonderful and he was fun and, but again, you know, I didn't want, I didn't like reading and I didn't want to work at it because Playing by ear was much more fun. Right. So I can read a, a, like a fake chart slowly to learn a song, but boy, on the fly, I'm not real good. Right. You know, and, but my ears, my ears, not bad. And, uh, and then I met a bunch of guys that all played by ear and started playing with them and they became my first real teachers. Mm. And, uh, and that continued, uh, into adulthood, different musicians over the years, certainly. But when I got to Santa Cruz around 1993, uh, the music was really percolating. I was still working a day job that I didn't dig. And uh, I started performing around Santa Cruz. And then I put my first group together. And these guys, uh, actually the first, now I think about it, the first band was called the Band of Johnnies. And the theme was, the idea, the concept was, everybody in the band gets a Johnny name. So the bass player, who was like this tall, 
and had these huge hands. He went by Johnny Fingers. Nice. That was that was great. Oh, right? The drummer who was a knucklehead. Uh, he went by Johnny Lovelace, and we both the rest were going. What? I don't, I don't understand. It keeps getting better. Go on. <laughs> so, the band we only played for maybe six months, and went, you know, bye bye. Right. Was it a three piece? Two piece, yeah. Okay, and then and, you had Johnny Fabulous, and I was Johnny Fabulous, and so by that time, enough people had come to. It was starting to, you know, percolate around town, and on this restaurant owner came to see me one night. He says, "I'm I'm looking," or came to see us. So I'm looking for like a duet or maybe a solo thing. Could you put something together? I went, sure, no problem. And the band fizzled. And by that time, I was Johnny Fabulous. Right. So in the interim, I was playing this little uh, English pub in Capitola Village called, oh, man, it was called, <laughs> it's one of those, it'll come to me. We might have to edit it in later. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, this guy was owned by an English guy. He was very funny. And there were a bunch of English psychologists that lived in Capitol at the time, and they would come there and have beer while I would play. Okay. And I put my card, a band of Johnnies, on the bar, and they all started passing it back and forth, and they started laughing hysterically. I mean, hysterically. I'm going, what? What? And it's not that funny of a name. So finally, the bartender tells me that oh, the owner says, in England, a Johnny is a prophylactic. And I went, that's awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> you, you can't make this up. I had no I, idea. That's I was thrilled. Cheers. To a band of Johnny's. Yeah. <laughs> mm. And then I had a series of bands afterwards. And all of the guys from that time forward were all so much better and more advanced in music than me. That's the yeah. secret. And, and if you play with people that are better than you, you're going to improve. You're going mm -hmm. to learn things. And they were all my teachers, every drummer, every bass player. I didn't work with a lot of guitar players. I, I like the saxophone because they only play one note at a time. <laughs> Less conflict. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Tell that to Kitty Green. You know Kitty Green? Uh, I might. She's been on the channel. She literally started a song upstairs in room six playing the saxophone turned around and went, began playing piano the whole time singing. Wow. So, yeah, that was fun to figure out, m miking and cameras. But she does not play one note at a time. She huh. plays like an artist. Huh. I mean, an artist <laughs> would play. Yeah. But, yeah, I thought that's, that's a hilarious line, though. I love that. We had, uh, over the years, I had a lot of duets with uh, different saxophone players. The guy that I worked with the most, his name is Gary Regina. Hmm. We used to call him Scary Vagina just for fun. Wow. And uh, he was really interesting. He played tenor and he played soprano, but his his re first sax, I would say, was called the C melody, which is in between the tenor and the alto. Isn't there another name for that? Not that like I'm a contrera of. or something? I, I, I remember, I, I've yeah, heard I of this, know. but I don't remember calling it the C melody. Anyway, well, evidently, the thing with the alto and the C melody is the fingering, if you use the same fingering, it's a third apart. Huh. So he had, he'd blow them both at the same time and have these harmony parts worked out. And so for two guys, it was a ton of noise. That must be amazing to hear. Like you're watching a saxophone player and all of a sudden there's, it, there's two saxophone players yeah. <laughs> with no extra body. Well, we'd be playing a restaurant and people would just stop and they'd go, look at that. You know? Yeah. And it's, it was such a strike. And he was great at it. He was really I'm going to have to look it. this up, this, in, this instrument. One of the best parts about this channel, I've said it before, is that I, I hear about instruments and about musicians I've never heard of. Hmm. And and as I'm editing, I'm like, okay, make a note. Let's go check that out. Because I try to always be learning. And it's hard, you know, it's hard, especially when you have a, a thing you're passionate about, like I do with Room 6. You get kind of in your own world and you're like, okay, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? What's the next thing? That's why I made the line of merch. It says, make music, not excuses, to remind myself, hey, turn around every now and then. Uh, available at room6.shop. Hey, uh, to, to remind myself, turn around sometimes and go touch the guitar wall and the drums and the piano you have in room six because mm. it is so easy for me just to hours and just days. And it, it's just becomes landscape or furniture. Uh, uh, we were talking off camera. I, I don't remember the last time I touched my drums. Probably a month. Sorry, Sean. Uh, because I, I just, every time I'm about to do it, it's like, well, no, I gotta, I gotta do this and I gotta do that. These are self-imposed time restraints and, and scheduling restrictions I put on myself for you people because I want to continue to put out, you know, quality uh, product that promotes the local scene. That being said, I have, 
I have had to have stern talks with myself lately about, you know, I'm currently working on a collaboration with uh, ZP Herring. He's being very patient with me while I put together a guitar solo for a song uh, that he's got. And uh, I've got the solo done. I just can't find the time to sit down and record it. Because uh, you know, recording a song is not the same as playing it. Especially if you're the one being, being engineer as well. Yeah, that makes it's just like two two separate parts of your brain at work. Yeah, so I I I don't think you're watching this ZP, but if you are, I swear I'm gonna get to it. I promise. It's there. It's just it's there. <laughs> it's just not necessarily here. No, it, I I know what I want to do, and it's just finding that time to really be like in focused and dialed in. I don't want to phone it in. Hmm. I don't want to just be like five minutes of done. Here you go. And have him say, well, but thanks, I guess. it's. You, I can tell you didn't really. So, and that's that's what comes from, we also talked off stage. My wife would always say, put your ass into it. <laughs> put, your, put your back into it. Um, I, I we, we talked off stage. I'm a singer who happens to play some other instruments. And so that's the hard part is turning off the singer brain and the songwriting brain and, and be like, okay, now you're a guitarist. Now you're going to do this. Hmm. Now you're a drummer. Now, now you, you know. Because drumming is not the same as piano or guitar or singing. I'm sure it's not. It is not because you have to be like, it's not about showing off. Hmm. That's I mean, right. It's There's moments. There's moments. But you, the better you are at literally being just a metronome and also the drills, the drills, the drills to where it's, it, you're, you drill, you're doing, you know, you're doing drills and you don't, you, you're not even really. It's so, you're so, the muscle memory, and you're just, you're so dialed in that you're just like, you know, I'm not, you know, oh, oh yeah, that's what I was doing. You know, <laughs> whereas with guitar, you know, you, you can't just, you can't really do too much on guitar before you start to have to feel it. Huh. And, and singing, of course, nobody wants a deadpan singer monotone. Right. So, I didn't start singing until I was a teenager, I was thinking. Leads me to my next question. Yes. So we talked about, it, two was when you started really getting in, into piano. Or, or That's when I would gravitate to discover it. I yeah. want to talk about musical influence. What was that earliest musical influence mm. that said, I want to do that for a living instead of, you know, as opposed to whatever else, because I know it wasn't at two years old. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, right, you know, right. But when did you make that, that transition of, you know what, I want to be a musician? Mm. Well, it was later. It was much later. Uh -huh. uh, Please do tell. In my... In my Teenage years, I kept playing and I was learning and growing. And in my, or I got married um, pretty young in life and started raising a family. So I just went to work. You know, I had a day job and I still played. Uh, and then, you know, changes in life. And uh, uh, I was a, a single guy again. Oh. And uh, I was living in Santa Cruz. I, had a, I worked at, for an electrical distributor and I hated my. I just hated it. I, I felt like such a liar. Doing selling or? Yeah, I was a sales guy. And it's hard <sighs> to sell things that you don't care about, right? Yeah, I've sold I've sold a lot and I know. I'll bet. Yeah. Yeah. And and so I, I remember this so vividly. I'd driven out to Watsonville to go see this contractor. And we went over a set of blueprints. And on my way there, though, I had an idea, like a musical idea. And ah. so he was talking and it would, to me it was just like the, the teacher on. Wah, 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 wah. Yeah, exactly. Yes, the yes. Wah, wah. And, and I got back into my car when I left and went, I, I no have idea. no idea what just happened here. And I drove back to the office and I thought about it for a, while, a couple hours. I went back to the office and I went to the manager who was a, a buddy of mine. I said, look, I would like for you to lay me off. I'll go on un unemployment and figure out my music thing. You will be a hero because the job, they're going to cut me eventually anyway. And he, he did, and I did, and then the next thing that happened was I was working in Santa Cruz, and this the dot com thing was going on in the nineties. Ah. There was money and gigs everywhere, and I didn't realize that that I I caught a wave. Right, right, right. I, I, I just thought, I just thought it's me. And, it's, and, and you, know, you already had Johnny Fabulous at this point. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, and for about a year, year and a half. Wait, spoiler alert: Fabulous is not his surname. <laughs> Which, if your last name is fabulous, I mean that's that's pretty fabulous. It would be. Go ahead, you're, you're yeah. saying. Uh I forgot what I was saying. 
uh, layoff and money. Oh yeah, so this wave, I just happened to catch this wave where there, for several years it was just so busy. It was great. And I was playing all these, the Shatterbrook restaurant in Capitola and all these one ideal bar and grill down at the wharf and all these great places. And I was probably in my early thirties and, and the servers were all in their twenties and we all go out afterwards. It was just a, a rocking nice. great time. And, and people were still interested in music. Uh, like they were there for music, not, oh, there's music, I'm, I'm going to enjoy it. Yeah, people were out, they were excited about local uh, acts, and, and there were a lot of really creative acts in Santa Cruz at that time doing unusual uh, music, and people were into it and, and supported it very well. Eventually, over the years, uh, the, a lot of people, because of the, the rise in housing, the artists had to leave. And the people that replaced them were folks that wanted to hear what I call Friday Night Jukebox music. Mm -hmm. brown -eyed Good name. Girl. Good right? name. Brown Eyed Girl. You know, all the staples. Brown Eyed Girl? <laughs> I played in a cover band for seven years. I'm not familiar with Brown Eyed Girl or Mustang Sally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which, actually, I like Mustang Sally. I, but, but You know, like, you think you do until you play for seven years in a cover band and you're like, well, I only like Wilson Pickett's version. <laughs> That's the version we did. There we go. Ahead. That of his is something else. Anyhow, <laughs> that's, the, I, that's the version I tried to do. I yeah, say. yeah. It's uh, but the scene changed. It really did, and um, people just became more and more interested in in these staples, right? Uh, rather than a, a new idea. And by that time, I was starting to move into this senior community convalescent home work, which I really love, and I probably. You know, step back from my own writing because I mean I've been writing since I was a little guy. Right. So this it's deep in my bones to have ideas and write songs, and I have very. I, I guess I have clear ideas, of, um, a, a clear concept of what I think a song should be structured like, and blah blah blah. I mean, it's just my opinion, right. but but I definitely have a a template and a format, and then in terms of the way I think about things, you, you know, style is, this, your own. is this song going to have an A section, a B section, and a C section? Or is it just A, B? Or is there going to be another interlude? You know, how do I tell you? Do you, like, I, I've been trying to write songs that have these little verse in the beginning. Like they used to write in the 30s and 40s. You know, like Cole Porter and those guys were right, right. Uh, and stuff. Uh, and I got a couple of those, you know, where it's like this kind of rubato thing. And I just sing this. And then the tune starts. And so the process of songwriting has always been really of great interest to me. I remember vividly you asked me about things that made you go like this. My mom and I, it was probably 1969 or 70, so I was seven or eight, and we, she had this Ford LTD. Nice. It went from here to that wall over there, a huge car. Yeah, it's a white, white it's a land yacht. It's white <laughs> with uh, black vinyl. Remember that? Those vinyl tops? It's still a thing. Yeah. Vinyl tops, just, it's only a thing if it's a classic. It's right. They don't do it anymore because they have this problem of rusting underneath. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it had an AM radio, and this tune came on and she she said oh i want, didn't want you to hear this it had just come out she cranked it and uh, and you're how, it, old, you're how old i'm probably seven or eight and oh, wow and she she was already very in tune with my taste which is pretty awesome that is awesome. good job mom yeah and it came in and went what goes up must come down. And that's enough for copyright. Right? <laughs> In the United States, copyright law allows for the fair use of copyrighted material under certain limited circumstances without the prior permission from the owner. Under the law, determinations of fair use take into account the purpose of the use, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount and substantiality of the work used in relation to the work as a whole, and the effect of the use upon the potential market for the copyrighted work. Other jurisdictions may have similar copyright provisions protecting fair use or fair dealing. If you are uncertain as to whether a specific use qualifies as a fair use, you should consult a qualified copyright attorney. I, I remember thinking, what is that all about? What is that? What is that? And I, that, like, it was a thing where my, my attention went here, and then all of a sudden, bands like Blood, Sweat, and Tears, Chicago. Oh, yeah. Um, Chicago will make you want to be a musician. And I just I just loved those tunes and the horns and the whole, whole business. And then later on, as I got older, I got exposed to acts like The Sons of Champlin. Mm. Uh, Lydia Pence in Cold Blood. I haven't heard of that one. Oh. What did it say again? Lydia Pence 
and Cold Blood. She came out at the same time as Tower of Power and the Suns and all those Bay Area acts. L- Lady of Pence. Lydia. Oh, Lydia. Lydia. Sorry, I'm hearing Lady of Pan- Pants. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, Lady of Pants? What a weird name. Lydia Pence, yeah. as in Michael. As in Mike Pence. Okay. I mean, yeah, same name. Right? Okay, yeah. Lydia and, Pence and, and Cold, Cold Blood, Blood yeah. which is a cool thing. And she was a beautiful, she was a little tiny little gal with this incredibly fiery, soulful voice. She's just one of my favorites. But they had all these hip, hip horn arrangements that were different than Tower of Power and different than the Suns. Each one of those horn bands in Chicago, mm-hmm. they each one had their own flavor of horn arrangements. A flavor. And I love them all. Mm-hmm. I love them all. So uh, as, I, as I continued in my songwriting, I began to write songs that are screaming for horn sections. And that would be this one. I was just about to talk about this, talking about horns. The Curious Reprise. Yeah. Did I say it right? Uh, well, it, it, some people say reprise. I know. And I wrong. like reprise. They're wrong. I agree. But no, it, so he also has this album, The Curious Reprise, which is very horn heavy, he says. Yeah. I haven't heard it, and I'm, I'm going to hear it. Um, is there something in here besides the CD? Mm-hmm. Feel right there. Well, that feels suspicious. Don't be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. Oh, don't be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. You got a pin in there or something? I don't know. Some what? souvenir pin? Probably a roach. Right, a roach clip. Nice. <laughs> <clears throat> also dating ourselves. Mm. I just, I just did a. I'm literally right now editing a video about a 420 celebration at Chiba Hut, <laughs> and I was thinking, I wish I had a roach clip like I did. Growing up, my brother, who's nine years older than me, back in the 70s or whatever, had given my mom a roach clip with like a nice feather. <laughs> cool. It was blue and white, I think. And and I, for whatever reason, I got the roach clip as a, you know, preteen and a teenager. But it was just there. It was just clipped on a thing. You know, it was no big deal. I wish I had it now. <laughs> just for the prop. If yeah, yeah. Big, big prop. But anyway, let's talk uh, horns in on the Curious Reprise. So, um, I had some guys that, uh, you know, mostly saxophone players, uh, help me with the arrangements. Okay. Um, I would just c- come up with, you know, lines, lead lines that I thought were important. They would... M- musical lead lines, you mean? Yeah, like, ba da ba 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 you know, that kind of stuff. And that's R- the horns. And, and sometimes yeah. when there was, uh, you know, harmony parts, they would fill a lot of that in for me. And, and on some tunes, I re- don't really have, especially at that time, didn't have great understanding of how a horn section works. So they filled in a lot of it. The gaps and did great. Like there's a song called Steppin' Stone on there. Now Hal has a song called Steppin' Stone. I was gonna say Hal Savar. Hal Savar has yeah. a stone called Steppin' or has a song called Steppin' Stone. There's also, of course, the famous I'm not your Steppin' Stone. It's not the monkey song. No. Which <laughs> is great. When Hal sang that first time I heard it, I'm like, Did you steal that from the monkeys? That line. <laughs> but this is different. It, it is it's yeah, it's but it's got this horn section on there and the it's just wonderful. And there's a guitar player kind of a I guess he's kind of a legendary guitar player, bro of mine. Uh, his name is Chris Kane. He's a wonderful. He's, he's no, a, he doesn't know me either. He's so a somebody. <laughs> he's a somebody on the blues circuit, and uh, he plays this crazy, ridiculous soul. There's a guy in town here, John Wiedemeyer. Do you know John? The name I've I've come across it on like he's in, like on a, Facebook or he's whatever. He's like a first call guy. He's just he's busy. He plays great. Anyhow, he right, plays right. on a couple tracks, and uh, but mostly it's a horn heavy album. And uh, we did. Oh, this is interesting. We did a. A version of Elvin Bishop's "Fooled Around and Fell in Love," and there's this guitar line. Oh, there, that is yes, that is. Remember that tune? Yeah, I always love that. I sing it like a, a fifth below Mickey, you know, because <laughs> his voice is way up there. Yeah, don't don't try to match your favorite songs if you don't have the the range. <laughs> yeah. But what we did was there's that there's this lead line that Elvin plays. So instead of having a guitar do that, we had the horns Ooh, nice. do the guitar. Part. Was a, it a swell or just punk, punching it? Uh, it? Just that, just, nah, nah, yeah, yeah, like yeah. that, yeah. And, I, I can hear and that. And it's very cool. And then Kane does this incredible solo, and uh, it's a, I, I don't, I usually don't have cover songs on my albums, but I just love that song so much. You know, it's one of those where I wish I'd have written it. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I have a ton of those as well, but mm-hmm. I wish I'd, um, I never did on my, I, I have two albums, and, and I never put a cover on them, only because I wasn't confident enough in myself at the time oh. to do a cover version of it. Meanwhile, you put me a karaoke. I'm your Where'd man. You go, huh? <laughs> Somebody to love by Queen. Let's go. But uh, I just couldn't. Um... Also, I felt a bit poser- poserish. You know, I always felt like, you know, if you're going to put a cover on your album, 
that everything else is original, you better do a darn good job of it. Mm. Either making it completely your own or really paying... I'm feeling pressure now. <laughs> <laughs> good. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, all right, moving on. Mm. Side, sorry, rabbit hole. Um, I wanted to talk... Actually, you know what? This, this feels like a good time, because I'm empty, for a booze break. Booze break. We'll be back. We're back. Booze. Oh, cheers. By all means. Clink. Mm. Incidentally, I'm just going to say it again. If you want to help the channel, the best way you can help the channel, other than subscribing, is go to rim6.shop. Merch. I'm done. Although I do have cool merch like this. It says... Oh, that is cool. Yeah. Designed it myself, I did. <sighs> Didn't have a band of Johnny's or nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never going to hear Johnny's ever again. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> that is awesome. Anyway, <laughs> so we, we got a little off track. I want to talk about your earliest musical influence and what was it that really said, like, I want to do music for you know a living or, or I want to at least be a musician? Yeah. There was a... Uh, my, folk, my folks were very uh, devout in their faith, and so a lot of the music I listened to uh, was gospel type of music. Yes. And, uh, there was uh, a fellow in... The wells of the Gospel. That's right. Uh, there was a guy in the in the 70s named Andre Crouch. You know, he had an act called Andre Crouch and the Disciples. And he had a particular approach to the piano that as soon as I heard it, I went, that, right? That, whatever that is, I'm going to figure that stuff mm -hmm. out. And a lot of it is in, in gospel type of piano. There's octaves, da, da, da. Sure. It's an octave thing. The and, octave bells. You know, that kind of thing. And I still use a lot of that. It's just so deep in my bones. And he had a, a template or a format, the way he wrote songs, that just made sense to me. And although his subject matter was, you know, uh, um, spirituality and faith and religion and whatnot, uh, I like the way he unfolded his thoughts in song. So, what I I didn't write those kinds of songs, but when I did continue writing songs, I I like to write about the human experience, about a particular thing that we all feel. Otherwise, I'm just telling my story, and and I, so. But there are guys that are great story songwriters. Like Hal is a great story songwriter. Yeah, he's, I don't he's really write those kinds of songs. I mean, there are some that have a storyline, but for the most part. Uh, maybe that's not true. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Now, as I think about it, there are stories, but they're all based on a true story. That's for sure. But I like writing songs that that somehow tap into the human experience, this collective experience that we all have, right, while alive. And and then later on, of course, you know, the Beatles are certain have touched all of our lives as writers. Yeah, it's really rare to find anybody who wasn't influenced at least a little bit by the Beatles, even if it was to say, I don't want to make that sound at all. Right, right. Well, you know, my sister is 10 years older than I, so she was like 12 when the Beatles arrived, mm. and or 11 or whatever. And so well, I was like one when they arrived. Yeah. And so my sister was buying those albums since I oh, was one was years old. Oh, she was prime market for them. And Oh, perfect, yeah. And, and so growing up, uh, those records were on, they were on, and I was, you know, playing them too because I, I just love music so much. And it was interesting because I didn't listen to the Beatles for many, many, many years. And when I was working on the Curious Project, uh, the Beatles anthology in the mid '90s mm -hmm. uh, was happening, and that just that pulled me back in. And I went visit all the old albums, and I re realized that even those very first albums, Please Please Me, and you know the, the pre Hard Days Night albums, right? The ones where it's just like, here's the song, your guys are gonna play it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Before they started to, to getting cute, uh, getting cute. Those, uh, <laughs> those, er, like all those. I, I remember them all, even though I hadn't heard them since I was a little boy. You yeah. Know? Now, for me, I mean, the Beatles stuff, I like it as it got weirder with time. You right. Know, the Magical Mystery Tour and Pepper and Rubber Soul and Revolver and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, they have this way, if you spend enough time with them, they have this way of opening you up as far as ideas. Oh, yeah. And you hear things in the music that on the radio maybe you didn't hear just because, yeah. you know, you're like, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club. But you listen to, I used to, I used to go to sleep listening to the entire Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album. Yeah. 
And there are things you hear yeah. in the, just over and over and over. It's like watching your favorite movie over and over. Oh, the, yeah, 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 yeah. Like Harry Potter, we watch Harry Potter a lot. And for I've Screw seen you, J.K. Rowling. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> for years, you know, I kept watching them, and I go, I didn't notice that before. You know, some picture moving on the wall, or there's something in every scene. And a oh, Beatles yeah. album is very much like that. When they came out with the the Love Show, and they did that album of the remixes. Oh, here in town, it. sir. Uh, but they did a, a CD to to coincide right. with the the circus. So the Slate show. Yes. Which I hear it's amazing. So yeah. one of the few Cirque shows I, I haven't seen. I saw it when it first came out. I remember I just booed. I cried through the whole show. Oh, I, mean, I thought you said first you booed. Oh, no, no, no. Boo hoo. You're the guy in the crowd going, boo. <laughs> and they're taking me out. Boo. In cuffs. Okay. No. He just did a quadruple <laughs> cuff, cuff, somersault, but you're booing him. <laughs> so, but I, yeah, I, just, I just cried through the whole thing. Anyhow, uh, when I got the CD, uh, they had done a, a Master, oh, that's the wrong word, but wonderful job on the remastering of I Am the Walrus. And I heard, yeah, I had heard all kinds of parts in there that I'd never heard before. Because yeah. it was just everything you could, it was so clean and clear. You went, oh, wow, there's so much more going on here than what I was aware of. Tech, you know, technology, you know, no matter what you think, it, it's it's there to make things better generally. Hmm. Um, so, tangent, I literally was editing a video yesterday. Saw there was an update available for that editing program, and, I, and that program I was using for color correction, and it was like, all right, well, you can, here's a slider for color saturation, for just all of it, all the colors. Hmm. It wasn't giving me what I wanted. And I did the update, suddenly, red, green, blue. <laughs> I'm like, hey! Oh. Yeah, suddenly, yeah, let's get all there. Suddenly, it, it became a lot better. Yeah. I still ended up re-recording because perfectionist, but you know. But it was it was nice. It was one of those. It didn't make it worse, <laughs> which you know. Whenever you install an update, you're always like, "Eh, I better back up everything." Um, all right, moving on. We're almost done. Sure. Wanted to say, let's talk about gear. We are going to be seeing him up in room six, performing on his own piano, his own keyboard that he uses for for gigs. What is it? What do you rock at a gig? What What is it that you bring to play on? And and do you bring your own microphone as well? Uh, it depends, really. Like, if I'm doing these senior communities and it's a small room, I have a big voice. I mean, I've got, I've got volume and, and some, still got some power. And uh, so I just sing to them. And, uh, in fact, that's... Well, really, you don't microphone don't at all. I don't use a mic or anything. And uh, I like that very organic, you know, just acoustic piano in my voice. Right. The ultimate, here's the ultimate, is you've got, if you've got a bitchin' a grand piano, I mean a sexy grand piano, and you flip the lid up, mm -hmm. and you're singing, oh, and it's across the strings, and it's cross, oh, yeah, that is the, that's the bada bing right there, that's the thing, bada bing, but that's not what you play though, <laughs> uh, no, I, I use this keyboard, he doesn't take a grand piano around at all, <laughs> yeah, and I, I'm not a gear guy, um, I, I have been, I was a rolling guy for many years, I'm still, mm -hmm. that's my favorite, I made a boo-boo and I left it in the car and it locked the car and somebody ran away with my Roland. So I bought this one. Yep. And it's it's uh, it's weighs literally half of what the Roland. So that's a big plus. Yeah. I, I'm not a I just helped him carry it upstairs. It's not that bad. No, it's twenty. Uh, I think it's twenty three pounds. The Yamaha in room six is a lot heavier. Let me yeah, tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's old. like you're putting it on. The, I hope the stand holds. It's that <laughs> heavy, but um. So so it's a Roland. Uh, is that your rock right now? What is no, it? this is a Yamaha. Oh, I mean, sorry, it's the Yamaha. And, uh, Yamaha. And I, I'm going to get another Roland because I like that FP7. Mm. Um, but this is easy to get around. Yeah, it's not too it's bad. It's lightweight and it does have uh, some cool. It's got a couple of road sounds that I really like, and it's got a. Um, it's got one piano song that sound that I am okay with. A lot of them. It, I expect more of you, Yamaha. I expect more. <laughs> Yamaha, there should films. not be any mud down on the bottom, and there's a bit of mud, mud. in some of, the, some of the patches. But anyhow, I've never been much of a gear guy. Uh, I just, I'm really just a piano guy. Really, it's, yeah. I'm just. A, I mean, that would be that's like driving a nice car if you got a nice piano, and and playing these keyboards is like a moped to me. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Um, as far as microphone goes, though, you don't bring your own, right? I mean, well, you do if it's a... Yeah, I use a Sennhauser. Sennhauser, yes, yeah, Sennhauser. Because uh, the, uh, what's the one that everybody uses? Sure. The uh, Shures, yeah. Yeah, Shures. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
I forget the number. Sure, 58, 58s. That's right. 58. I've got one. And and they're cool. And they're cool. But the Sennhauser does something because I've got this kind of boomy. Right, right, right. You know, I don't have a, a high. I'm, I'm, I'm here, and it captures it in a way that the uh, the Shures don't. That's See, why. And I, I feel the same way. I have a Shure 58. It's got a dent. You know, <laughs> I um, think they come with a dent. Don't yeah. They? <laughs> and and that is the one. Like I'm going to a bar. Right. Here you go. I'm going to a place, a, a, a you know, place that I want to invite my mom to. I'm bringing my Electro Voice. I have an EV. Oh. Because it was a gift. Thank you very much, Bob. You're not watching this, but. Thank you so much. <laughs> Former drummer, he said, he, one day he rocked up. He's like, hey, man, come out to your driveway. Here, I'm tired of you singing through that thing. And he hands me one. And he just gave me a, Sweet. he's like, you need a real microphone because you, you, you're singing too good for, you know. And I was like, yeah. thank you so much. You know, uh, you know, when we were in the studio doing the Dream World Project, the uh, engineer had a, it was a knockoff, but it was um, a Neumann knockoff. Annoyment. Yes, Annoyment. They, they, there is a and, knockoff. Microphone. But he had a, a ribbon microphone, mm. yeah, and and I guess the, the thing is the ribbons are recording for both sides, right? So you can pick up some room, whereas the other ones are just right at your right. So, so we we did a, a thing where we set up the the Neumann and this ribbon next to each other. The comparison. And I sang, and then we we flipped back and forth, and, oh. I, I, and yeah. it was. Hands down, ribbon mic. As I'll a, never use anything but a ribbon mic from here on. For out. recording, you mean? For recording. Yeah, yeah. For recording. Yeah. I mean, I, I was. I remember going through my second album where I did everything on the album except the drum kit because at that point my the my former bass player, shout out BJ, Redstone Studios. My former bass player was better on the drum set than I was, and he and and he was like, hey, I'll you know. I was like, I know what I want, but I I don't think I can. Be consistent with it. Yeah. That's been my. That's the problem with drum with drumming for me, is the consistency, um, for an entire song. So he he did it, and I had this moment, this whole talk with him, about how I I kind of I'm, I'm I'm I don't know whether I want to put stuff on the album that I can't replicate live, or do I put all this stuff on there that's going to sound really cool? And he's like, you want to put out your best you know, your best foot forward. You want to show people, here's what I can do. Yeah. So you're if Sergeant Pepper. If you're playing by yourself <laughs> with an acoustic guitar, they don't expect all the other stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And if you're playing with a band, well then, it's your music. You can do what you want, you know? Right. Um, and so I have a track. <laughs> I still can't believe I did this. And I just kept saying, again, again, and I just kept recording a different guitar solo every single time. Because I wasn't, and finally, I was, he played them, he, and I was like, what if you play them all together? Yeah. And it worked. Wow. Seven tracks. <laughs> Crazy. I'm never going to replicate that live. No, no. One of them's backwards, sure. I think, if I remember. <laughs> but it totally worked. And I just remember, like, uh, I was like, what have I done? I can never replicate this. Hmm. Even, like, if, if I listen to it, I can't pick out one solo so I just have to do with what? Well, this is the best I got. So you know, uh, when we were recording uh, the Curious album, uh, the bass player and I were talking about the project, and he said, "So he nailed it." He said, "So you want to record at the level that you'd like to be performing at?" I went, "Yeah, that yeah, what he said, yeah." And uh, and that was my concept at that time. This large thing, you know, the the background vocalist, the uh, the horn section. So we did some shows, and in Capitola they have a thing called the Twilight Concert on Wednesday nights. It's a two-hour show, right there at the beach. I mean, you're playing here at the beaches. Right <laughs> and reminds me of a story. Uh, Go ahead. It was you know, and there's you know, a couple thousand people come out, and it's glorious. So we had this this review of there was uh, four four horns and plus bass and drums and and the gals uh, singing with me and. And it was just magic. It was just everything I wanted, you know. And but then once I did it, I went, man, this is a lot of work. Yeah, this is a lot of work to try. Yeah. And, find. and there were existing large ensembles. Mm -hmm. Like I had to gather everybody. We were not a band. I gathered everybody. We rehearsed and we worked it out. But we weren't like, uh, you know, the Santa Fe Horns or any of these guys that are their units. You know. Yeah, yeah. And I, I just felt like. Those guys should have these venues. They should have space in these type of, like this Twilight concert I mentioned. They should be on these gigs. Right. Because, you know, I was happy playing with the trio too. Once, once I did that a few times, I went, okay, the trio's cool. Yeah. So my trio was called 
the Johnny Fabulous Orchestrio. Oh, ah, isn't that cool? Thanks. I like that one. Yeah, I'm going to resurrect that here in Vegas. What I'd like to do in, in in Las Vegas is build my clientele with with the senior communities, and that's that's my you know that's my bread and butter, for, but it's also right. my passion. But I do love songwriting, and I love performing my songs, and and uh, you know for those that are into it and get it, it's it's just a delightful thing. Uh, so I'm gonna eventually I'll find the right bass player, the right drummer. And maybe a saxophone player, but uh, just have a small ensemble, and then maybe you know just play once or twice a month at some place that does or, you know allows original music. Right. Now, are you familiar with a gentleman named Sar Sheffer? Mm-hmm. Well, he's local, and and he's a keyboard guy, but he also uh, works for Steve Byers, and among other people. And he does he he's got you know some connections. He was the first uh, keyboardist for a jazz standards band that I sang for real briefly before qu- quarantine. Yeah. Thanks, COVID. <laughs> uh, called the Dirty Martinis. I was proud of that name. That's a good name. I even bought. I, I really I, like that. I, I found on on Etsy, Olive Green's best pocket squares and ties, Sweet. so you could just mix it around. And I gave it to the band, and then quarantine happened, and then uh, somebody moved away. But so now. The, you know, oh well. It's a great name. But a, it was the best thing for me because I was coming off of first being the frontman for a trio where I had to play guitar and sing. Mm. So, you know, even guitar solos, I got to run back to the pedal for the, you know, the rhythm right. and, and, and all that to just singing. And I, ha- I bought the Shure. How heavenly is that? I bought that Shure mic that looks like a ribbon mic, but it's yeah. not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I loved it. Oh, it was so nice. It's a sharp look. And I was ready to work the crowd and then quarantine and we never played a game. Yeah. But we were good. And, um, Just standards or what? what yeah, 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 jazz standards. Just, you know, Tony Bennett, uh, sure. Sinatra, Sinatra and, and all that. Cole, all yeah, that. Cole Porter, all that stuff. And, and we were, um, we were getting to that point as a band where you, you know each other, you know, I know what's coming. Here it comes. And you know when somebody messes up and you just go, pick up. And, mm-hmm. you know, you move on. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Anyway, moving on. Cause we got to get this man playing some music up for room six. Thank you very much for sticking around. One more question. Sure. We're going to talk to, Little Johnny Fab. <laughs> Let's pretend we're talking to new musicians. One of which is Little Johnny Fabulous. Mm. What do you? What is one thing that you wish someone had told you before you got in the music business? And don't say, well, I would say don't change, say change your strings, but you're a piano player. So. <laughs> I don't know. What is one thing that you... Okay, better let me back up. Somebody comes up to you after a show and says, how do I play like you? What is one thing that you wish, like one, th- well, one thing you want to tell new musicians to do? Learn from people that are really good and that play the type of music that you want to play in a, in a style that, that thrills you. Um, and here's the thing. Mm-hmm. Now, that, now, I'm, now I'm off and running. Okay. <laughs> Bring it. Here's the thing. I remember when I was a, a teenager, there was this guy in Fresno. And he was an amazing singer. He was really great. But he like he got most of his stuff from Kenny Loggins. Okay. Right? And it was awesome. And you, you go hear me go, man, he could do all that stuff. It's incredible. But people referred to him as the guy that sounded like Kenny Loggins. And I remember I remember making a mental note of that. Like, uh-uh. Yeah, be yourself. Uh-uh. What you do is you grab a little from this guy, a little from that guy, everything that thrills you so that you become an uh uh uh, accumulation of ingredient, ingredients of all the things that you've loved, but don't take everything from one artist. Uh, there was a guy in Santa Cruz who sounded a lot like um, uh, Johnny Mathis. Okay, I don't remember his name. You know why? Because he's the guy that sounds like Johnny, Johnny Mathis. Mathis. And I just I thought, no, I don't want that. And and for me, uh, I had multiple interests genre wise. So there is, you know, the hallways of jazz and. Uh, the wells of gospel and um, whatever whatever my bit is uh, the, discovered in the hallways the of the blues of drawn from the wells of gospel and inspired by the colors of jazz I wrote that <laughs> uh, but I, I, I think that's really important is to um, first of all study with somebody or study people that you really dig and grab a little from here and there so you don't sound like that other guy yeah it's 
As far as the business end, I have never figured that out. I can't uh, help you at all. But as far as an artist, I was determined to have my own sound, and uh, and and it is. It's a it's a I it's a very recognizable thing that I do, and it, I don't hear anybody else doing it. Uh, my wife is the same way. We got together. She's a fiery singer. She's great. Well, your wife sings too. Oh man, she's something. Do you want to give her a plug? Pam Hawkins. She'll be around some at some point. Uh, and she's she's really great, and she has a, a channel on YouTube, uh, Pam Hawkins, and she's a, people compare her to Tina Turner. She doesn't sound like Tina, but she feels like her. Okay, it's that kind of energy where you go pre or post Ike, and because uh, 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 there's a difference. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'd have to study it further. But yeah. as far as just like she's got this, she she float when she sings, she dances, and she's mesmerizing, you know. Right. But one of the things when we got together, she would have these choices of notes as a singer that were so unique and different than all the other vocalists out there. I right. said, what is this? Where does she get this from? Well, one day, <laughs> one day we were listening to a Betty Davis album, uh, Miles' uh, uh, wife, ex-wife, yeah. the funkiest woman on the planet. She just passed away last year. And I was, and Betty went, ah, you know, or something, one of those little Betty Davis things. And I went, oh, oh there okay. it is. All right. I, I got you now, but there's others, you know, I mean, she certainly has her, yeah. her influences, but she was, and she described how she would just pick a little from here and a little from there. And that way you can develop your own, because what you do is you're trying to replicate a sound that excited you and thrilled you. And you're not going to sound like them. Like me trying to sound like Ray Charles still sounds just like me. Yeah. Sounding you know like I mean? I'm, I'm not, an, I'm not an impersonator, but I, there are little things that each singer has. Like I was a really big, Edgar Winter's White Trash. Ooh. That's like, those are my guys. You That's know? deep. So there's Edgar and the other guy's name was Jerry LaCroix. Jerry had the, ah, you know, kind of growly thing and Edgar was, but they would do these licks and, uh, and like Edgar was just, you know, a trapeze artist with these licks. He'd, oh, 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 you know, all the, whatever you call that stuff. And so as, as a young singer, boy, I worked on that stuff day and night in my car everywhere. Right. And as I've gotten older, I do less of that kind of singing. But at the time, that was like the stuff I was grabbing on. And it would be hard to listen to that and point to me. Because me singing that, I don't sound like Edgar. Right. I just sound like me trying to do something that I heard. You know, so, so it comes out as an original thing, not a, a copy. You know what I mean? Right. So that's my advice to you young musicians. And I can totally speak to that uh, a little bit because... Ideally, what you want is to be sound familiar and yet be unique. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, when I sang my yes. very first, my very first band, it was in the '90s, and we sounded like the Rolling Stones. This is a bunch of like eighteen or nineteen year old kids, by the way, right. who were in band before they became a band. Mm. The, tr the guitarist was a trumpet player. Oh, that wow. kind of thing. Yeah, uh, but we we were the Stones with Eddie Vedder singing from Pearl Jam. Because that's just what was influencing us at the at time. At the time, right. And, and without even trying to, I'm singing like this. <laughs> and and, he, and I, I would have these kids come up and say, are you trying to sound like Eddie Vedder? I'm like, no, it's just there. I can't help it. But I also, I, dating myself, VCR tapes of, of MTV and VH1 videos. Hmm. And, and just watching them and, and working on like, okay, what do I want to sound like? Oh, there's there's uh, James Hetfield from Metallica. He's enunciating. You know? There are those guys. Need. Because it, what drives me nuts is when I listen to something, I'm like, oh, that's nice, that's nice, that's nice. And then the, the, the end of the word just drops off. Yeah. And it, if you do that enough, you're like, what are you singing? Yeah. yeah and yeah, I yeah, hate yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I, and, I want to be able to understand what they're... And that, there's a real thing, like Dave Matthews and all these... these Singers of that era start, got into this weird enunciation thing, mm -hmm. and I mean, I don't find it offensive, but I don't find it pleasing either. It, to me, it's like more work to listen yeah, to. Oh, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> believe me. And again, but, but you know what though? But going back to his point, that's the style that he said. That's me. It's mm -hmm. not like anybody else. Yeah, yeah, and, and I applaud them for that. Yeah. If somebody else comes up with that sound, they're going to sound like Dave Matthews. You yeah. Know? So, or, or, you know, and that's why I really try to write lyrics um, and, and new musicians. All we can do is give you direction. But really, for you, it's just throw stuff against the wall and see what sticks. Mm. 
Which is a whole other old saying that they won't know what it means. Well, and the audience will let you know what resonates. Yeah, definitely. Um, I have this song on the Curious album called I've Been Missing Mary. And uh, it's a weed song. Anyhow, it was, it's, re it's really catchy. It's, it's like one of those, it's a worm, worm hole, earworm, you know? Earworm, yeah. And, and I can remember in Santa Cruz, I had this beautiful dog and we used to walk a lot. And people would drive by in their cars and I was busy at that time. I was really active in music. And I can remember a couple of times somebody would be driving by and they'd see me with the dog. They'd go, Johnny Fabulous, I've been missing Mary. <laughs> you know, it's singing Dude, my... enough said. You, you hit, that's it. That's all you want. <laughs> that's, that's victorious. That is oh a triumph. Oh my God. You know? that is, as that's a songwriter, just... someone sings your own song at you? Yeah. Off, yeah. like yeah. out of the venue? <laughs> like, yes. Awesome. Well... We're going to hear, not that song, but we're going to hear some other music from him, unless you decide to do that song, up in room six. So thank you for sticking with us, and uh, thank you for checking us out. If you haven't been here before, really appreciate you. This channel is um, it's only growing and getting better. In the meantime, I guess we'll temporarily say goodbye. See so, you in a minute. See you in a minute. <laughs> cool. Um, to you. Cheers, man. Thank you for having me. And to you. Right. Bye. <laughs> this is called When My Voice Is Just a Whisper.
or I'm strong Each and every day When I'm old and gray And my voice is just a whisper I will sing for you Yes, I will. If it makes you happy, baby, I'm gonna sing for you. Hey, hey. Listen to me, baby. I love you, I love you. When my voice is just a whisper. This is called Curious. Mm, I want to know What brings you pleasure I want to feel What you feel when you turn on I've got to find your trigger I don't know what it is about you this feeling is so strong well I'm curious all about you baby I'm curious I don't mean maybe it's my intention to capture your attention and make you curious me too. Ooh, I want to know what it takes to shock you. I want to be what makes your body shake. I've got to find the rhythm that'll rock you, mama. My mind is full of wonder. My body just can't wait. I'm just so curious. All about you, baby, I'm curious. I don't mean maybe. It's my intention to capture your attention and make you curious. time to feel your heartbeat next to mine To capture your attention I'm curious All about you, baby, I'm curious
curious I don't mean maybe It's my intention To capture your attention And make you curious About me too This is called The Magic of Romance, although at times I sing The Magic in Your Pants instead, just so you know. When the fire of love grows dim, passion is gone within. There's things you can do to keep the flame alive. What's come over you? And hold her close whenever you dance. Give to her the magic of romance. Remember to touch her face. Warm her with your embrace. Let her know just what she means to you. Simply to say hello You'd be wise to let her know She's in your thoughts Whatever you may do And hold her close Whenever you dance Give to her the magic In your pants If she loves roses Tomorrow is another day. I don't think anybody can argue with that, although I'm sure somebody would want to. Tomorrow is another day, another chance to find your way. and say everything will be okay tomorrow is another day tomorrow is another day another chance 
chance to find your way Don't be ashamed You fell down You got to get your feet Back on the ground And say everything will be okay Yeah, tomorrow is another day Try again Try something new You'll be amazed at what it does for you Tomorrow is another day Try again Try something new You'll be amazed at what it does for you Oh, tomorrow is another day Tomorrow is another day is another day. I want to thank Johnny Fabulous or Johnny Fab for dropping by. It was a great interview and a great performance. If you want to hear some of his stuff, I've got links down in the description. You can get Dream World or The Curious Reprise. Uh, if you want to check him out, there'll be uh, links for his social media pages as well. And if you want to be on the channel, whether reviewed, interviewed, or both, hit me up using my email address or the social media link down in the description for the Room 6 social media. Also, that's how you can support the channel with merch or with buying my own CDs or uh, Patreon. All those things help, and they help the scene uh, because I'm going to do some cool things with the, with the money. Hey, how about that? <laughs> in the meantime, if you want to see more videos like this, please click up here. And if you want to subscribe to the channel, really appreciate it. Please click down there, down there. And don't forget to ring the bell. Remember to be amazing, and we'll see you next time on Room 6. Say goodbye. Thanks, man. Bye-bye. Ba-da-ba-ba-da-ba. -ba -ba -ba.